introduce uh, I'll just uh, ignore Shelley's warning not to get frightened when the recording uh, <laughs> starts. But um, I'll just introduce our first uh, paper of the day, which is a video essay from Daniel Nicolau Nicola Vidal and Jorge Perez Iglesias. Uh, Daniel Nicolau Vidal has a bachelor's degree in English philology from the University of Valencia and Al Albert Ludwig University. He is co-editor of the pop culture fanzine Le Bon Vivant, language teacher, translator, as well as a contributor to, to cultural press and digital media. Currently, he works with international news, agency, international news agencies for the Balearic Islands region of television. Jorge Perez Iglesias has a bachelor's degree in audiovisual communication from the University of the Balearic Islands, and a master's degree in contemporary film and audiovisual studies from Pompe Fabra University. Jorge is currently a PhD student at Pompe Fabra University with research interests in pop culture, fan studies, TV studies, and sitcom. Uh, so if you'd like to give a short introduction to the video essay, uh, please feel free whenever you're ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah? Yep, all good. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Jorge Perez. I'm one of the directors of this video of the treatment of your nostalgia in Trainspotting and its sequel. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organization of this panel for letting us participate this year. In 1996, Danny Boyle directed Trainspotting, one generational movie based on a novel by Irving Welsh about a group of drug addict friends in Edinburgh. The easy thing to do when you think about making a sequel is to place the same characters in the same location and enjoy the arc of their current lives many years later. But in 2017, Danny Boyle and John Hodge didn't offer us a pleasant and comfortable present in T2. The characters don't enjoy a happy life, now neither they did in the past. This is a key element and an interesting reading on how to show the evolution of some characters who are survivors of a tragic past. This is a rare abyss in the film industry nowadays. The common trend is Hollywood is to make revival products based on an eye candy and shooting nostalgia, avoiding any trail of an uncomfortable past. In the video, we try to analyze and compare the two films and see how the characters use nostalgia in a productive way. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, thank you. And hello again. Uh, I hope everyone's had a chance to check out the video essay from Daniel Nohe. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, paper and we we'll look forward to speaking a bit more about it in the Q&A a bit later. But uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our next speaker for this panel. Uh, Dr. Alex Hasty is a lecturer in human geography at Coventry University. He completed his PhD entitled Postcolonial Popcorn at the University of Sheffield in 2018 has published several papers from his thesis on postcolonial cinema, memory, geopolitics, and masculinity. His research lies at the intersection of postcolonialism and popular culture, exploring what postcolonial approaches can reveal about popular culture and vice versa. Whenever you're ready, Alex. Thanks, Adam. I'm sorry, I, I'm a bit out of breath. I just had to run up and down the stairs because the dog was barking at the door. So hopefully he's um, settled now. Um, I'll just share my screen. Hopefully this works all right. I've had a couple of technical difficulties the last couple of days. Um, okay, hopefully that's um, working. You can see that all right. Um, so good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, evening, depending where you are in the world. Um, and I hope you're all looking forward to this paper on EastEnders. Um, it's a really tough act to follow the, um, the train spotting video essay. I really enjoyed that. Um, so looking forward to discussion about that later. Um, as Adam says, I'm Alex Hasty. I'm a post-colonial geographer, so not a film or TV studies expert. Um, and I'm primarily interested in the intersections between post-colonial and, and popular cultures. And um, in examining um, BBC TV soap EastEnders, and I hope to do just that, examine the intersections between post-colonial and popular cultures by bringing a post-colonial lens to one of Britain's most watched and loved TV shows. Um, just to reflect on the title a little bit, I am going to be exploring nostalgia, family, and what Edward Said um, called imagined geographies um, of East London in, in EastEnders. The first part of the title, um, I, I wrote this before Dame Barbara Windsor sadly passed away just before Christmas. Um, and she, she utters this um, to Larry Lamb's character, Archie Mitchell, about 10, 12 years ago. And she says, you don't know who you're messing with. I'm not some cuddly old lady. 
I'm old East End, real East End proper. And um, I think that sums up the show. I think Peggy Mitchell sums up what the, the show is about. But there is that question about what old East End, real East End, proper East End actually means. Um, sadly, I won't be presenting empirical data, uh, kind of extensive research findings today. Um, rather, I am right at the start of this um, research um, and will pre be presenting more of my um, thoughts on the topic so far based on my insights as a fan, um, a sketch of the existing literature and some ideas on, on how to answer some of the questions that I have. So your feedback and thoughts are, are really valuable to me at this stage. Um, so for those of you who aren't EastEnders superfans, EastEnders has been on British screens since 1985, when it was created by Julia Smith and Tony Holland to rival long-established uh, Manchester-based soap Coronation Street, the one that people expect me to be a fan of and not EastEnders because I'm from Manchester. Um, rooted in its often dark take on working class life in the East End of London, um, EastEnders is anchored by family dynasties such as the Beals, the Fowlers and the Mitchells, represented here by their iconic matriarchs, um, Kathy Beale um, in, in the left, Peggy Mitchell, of course, played by Barbara Windsor on the right, and Pauline Fowler um, at the bottom. At the heart of the show's narrative, and to an extent its genre, is a dedication to family and a commitment to so-called East End values. Underpinning all of this, arguably, potentially, is a deeply nostalgic vision of London, uh, of London's East End, an imagined and potentially exclusive and exclusionary geography that revolves around gangland histories um, and everyday working class spaces such as the pub, the Queen Victoria, um, the laundrette, the market and the cafe. Whilst Albert Square um, has remained relatively unchanged in 35 years, the so-called real geography of London's East End is constantly changing, constantly being reshaped by um, processes of immigration, of gentrification, regeneration, political ideology, and cultural and, and sporting events like the Olympics, for example. Some of which is shown in the bird's eye view shot of the capital in the show's opening credits, to which Canary Wharf, the O2 Arena, the Olympic Park, amongst other things, have, have been added over the years. And as a geographer, it does surprise me that the show has been overlooked in my own discipline. And whilst that my contention with colleagues is, is perhaps for a different audience, a different conference, I think um, we need to go a little bit further uh, into this and it might help us um, understand the show's nostalgia a little bit and investigate and identify it. So um, the fictional uh, London borough of, of Walford, the, the home of EastEnders, with its postcode E20, as represented in the show, is somewhat ambiguous in its location. And that's because it's not meant to be representative of um, any particular area or borough. Nevertheless, there are certain places and people that are evoked um, by the very designation, the term East End, and in the show itself, ranging from um, Jack the Ripper and the Cray Twins to market stores, jelly deals and Brick Lane. One way perhaps to locate um, EastEnders and its fictional borough in, in one of the many boroughs of East London, ranging from um, Hackney to Bark and Dagenham, um, is to take a look at the onset tube map. Um, this, this particular image I got from um, the EastEnders uh, fandom wiki, which we'll come back to um, later, which situates Walford East Station on the district line and the Hammersmith and City line in place of the real life Bromley by Bow tube station. This would place Albert Square's residence in um, the most deprived, um, in the most deprived, most ethnically diverse and perhaps most well-known or traditionally East End, whatever that means, of London's boroughs, Tower Hamlets. Um, census data, um, which is interpreted here um, by um, Tower Hamlets Council, shows Bangladeshi groups accounting for about 35% of the population in the borough, 
just higher than white British. And in fact, all um, black minor minority ethnic groups account for 55% um, versus 45% white ethnic groups. Now, this is not to say that the EastEnders is, um, is, is kind of failing to represent Tower Hamlets because it doesn't claim to be representing that particular borough. And nor am I arguing that the show ought to have 31%, um, 32%, sorry, uh, Bangladeshi cast members or characters. Um, but it does, this does allow us just to have that discussion about, and raise some questions about what, where and who um, the show represents and what function it, it might play as the BBC's or one of the BBC's, up to who fans might, might disagree, um, kind of landmark shows. So with this in mind then, I, I have um, three research questions that are currently, three rough um, changing research questions that are currently um, guiding my thoughts on this. And, and one is um, what imagined geographies, to use again Edward Said's terms, of the East End of London does East Enders produce? Who do the show's values, spaces and histories potentially exclude? And we might think again of the Queen Victoria um, in pub, the market space, um, as well as some of those values, the East End values, family values. Um, who, who do they represent and, and potentially exclude? And how and where are these produced and contested? And this, this comes back to um, those of you who were in the, in the first panel um, some of those questions about textual um, analysis, looking at the show itself, as well as um, at its audiences and, and fans, of course. Um, and that's something I'll, I'll briefly come back to. Um, but first of all, just to um, just to think a little bit about the, the genre. And there is extensive work on, um, on soap genre, and I'm just going to pick up a little bit of it here. Um, Dunleavy and um, Kim and Long's work gives us some ideas of what soap as a, as a genre of television is capable of, including some, some key defining features, which include things such as um, a, a long running serialized narrative, which exposes the audience to, um, to kind of high levels of engagement um, with and investment in storylines and characters. Um, a focus on community and community spirit with often close knit characters, um, in interweaving storylines, uh, a deep emotional engagement with personal and domestic everyday life. And more often than not, soaps in the UK have been at the forefront um, of, with dealing with contentious societal issues, ranging um, from AIDS in EastEnders, for example, um, LGBTQ plus issues, knife crime, domestic abuse, alcoholism, um, amongst other things. Um, in often dramatic and tragic ways. Um, Dunleavy gives us a bit of an insight into the blueprint for, for this, um, of course, Coronation Street, and um, which they argue, um, uh, just to read the, the, the quote here, as a conceptual blending of British Northern realism and equally distinctive Northern humour and Soap's characteristic melodrama, fictional weather field and its colourful characters were open to universal readings and appeal. The combination of characteristics that Coronation Street's community pioneered for the genre, the ordinariness of Weatherfield people, their almost claustrophobic close-knittedness, their unwritten code of shared values, and their ears terminally cocked for neighbourhood gossip, lent itself to considerable imitation and adaptation in soap operas current, uh, sub subsequently developed, including EastEnders, as well as in Australia and, and other places as well. Um, there has been some work specifically on EastEnders and as I said at the start I haven't had the chance to, to go through this in, in lots of detail and I don't have the scope to, um, to go into it here but I do want to highlight um, Mamwedra and O'Donnell's um, work on this as they do make some insightful arguments about the soap based on 21 interviews with, with fans of EastEnders. They explore the soap as, as a site of cultural citizenship um, a site of public service and a site of resistance to neoliberal hegemony. And when I read that, uh, people who've raised eyebrows when I've told them an EastEnders fan, particularly in the discipline of geography where we don't do popular culture particularly well at times, I was pleased to read this, someone <laughs> attaching meaning and, and kind of justifying my interest in the programme for the last 10 years. Um, they acknowledge that EastEnders does indeed mobilise a nostalgic sense of community 
but they maintain that this in fact represents a distaste for neoliberal individualism. At the time 1985 the show first aired, we were in the midst of Thatcherism. Um, in favour of a, a long lost kind of social democracy and cultural citizenship, um, they found that viewers found the, the, the characters to be um, relatable, that social issues were believable, the setting generally realistic, with the show allowing um, for people to interpret their own lives and place in society. I'm not sure I totally agree with, with all of that, and I'd be interested to see what others um, have said about it. And in terms of nostalgia, um, the authors conclude that EastEnders offers neither a representation of London as it is now, nor even of London as it ever was. On the contrary, it is the expression of a community-oriented community worldview that is in many ways at odds with the dominant individualizing discourses of neoliberalism. I enjoy this positive outlook on the show and do not necessarily disagree that EastEnders offers a vision of community in neoliberal Britain. However, there are some questions um, unanswered about the other effects of mobilising this kind of nostalgia, questions that have been raised actually in, in, in the panel um, earlier this morning. Um, to whom is, is this realistic? Who is it appealing to? Who is that kind of nostalgic appealing to? Who is included in the story that it tells itself uh, about London and community? Um, who, is, who is excluded from it? Um, I haven't answered these questions yet, um, but I will do. Um, so nostalgia is, is, is often defined as a, as a longing for home, both um, physical and, and cultural, um, as I'm sure we're, we're all aware, as well as for the recovery of a, a past or, or elements um, of it or restoration um, of, of the past. How and where might we locate and investigate these phenomena in EastEnders? Is EastEnders itself um, nostalgic? Where do the fans and, and audiences um, fit in to, to the production of nostalgia? Or is it just that this lens of nostalgia allows us to understand the show's relationship with the past, with the present, with its audiences and with the city of London, perhaps the wider nation? How um, does or how can the show um, move forward and, and what might progress look like? And again, that was some, some questions that were raised um, in this morning's uh, panel as well we can see some of the sites where we might um we might investigate nostalgia textually diegetically um such as the the queen vic um the, the calf the laundrette and we might look for, for signs of progress in terms of, of where the show has has come in terms of new families new characters such as the the, the panasar family here on the right um and uh, the, the the new uh, mural um, which sprung up while the show was on a break um, in the summer because of COVID-19, with of course the, the protests and, and Black Lives Matter movement um, taking shape in that time. So these are some of the things that we, we might investigate textually um, in the show itself. So as a, as a post-colonial geographer then, I think um, post-colonial theory might be helpful, it might help us better understand the production of a nostalgic imagined East End of London. Now, the East of, of London may not have been the East that Edward Said had in mind when he wrote um, of the Orient in Orientalism, um, but his insistence on the need to examine the narratives and knowledge um, that empires create about the past is relevant here. And indeed, as um, Dennis Walder argues in his work on um, post-colonial nostalgia, Nostalgia is significant to anyone interested in histories of colonialism and decolonization. Others have, have, have done this and, and taken up this work in different ways, with um, Fletcher and Swain recently, for example, examining Yorkshire as an imagined um, cultural space accessible only to certain groups, exploring the case of cricket specifically as exclusive and white in the county. Um, also, uh, Wemis, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing their name correctly, in investigates what kind of East London is produced in imperial anniversaries and um, processes of remembering British imperial triumph, specifically in, in East London, um, at London's uh, old Docklands, in an area, uh, they comment, where Bangladeshi belonging is marginalised. 
Post-colonialism is well suited to these questions and to the investigation of nostalgia. It allows us to examine um, what is hidden, what is forgotten, and in this case to look um, perhaps for the spectres of colonialism, the absence of colonialism in London's version, in East Enders' version of London's East End. Okay, so methods that I intend to, to use, and this is fairly brief as you can see from the slides, um, are, are, are twofold. They, they involve looking at EastEnders episodes, so a textual analysis, a discourse analysis of, um, of, of popular and or iconic episodes um, of the show, um, looking at a, a sample for the ways in which um, the show mobilises nostalgia, um, producing particular um, imagined geographies of the East End of London. Um, and secondly, uh, sorry, I've got some images here, um, and you can see on iPlay that, that there is a, an archive, it only goes back so far in terms of availability, but interestingly, just picking up on some of the discussions had earlier, particularly during lockdown, East, B, the BBC were keen to show old episodes, iconic episodes, classic episodes, a whole series of episodes from 2008 and the, the Stacey Dooley series where she interviewed um, a whole host of, of the cast, particularly nostalgic um, short series looking at uh, characters, past uh, narratives and, and things like that. Um, secondly, I will investigate um, two fan sites so far. I'm also interested in, in social media side of things as well. Um, as Ivan was with the Doctor Who stuff earlier, um, particularly the EastEnders fandom wiki seen here and the uh, EastEnders Reddit, both of which are very active, um, have thousands of members, EastEnders wiki has thousands of pages, and there's a real um, detailed amount of information on there. And the aim of this is really to explore the role um, that fans play in producing nostalgia for the show, for old characters. We see Stenders bringing back old characters all the time, sometimes from the dead, sometimes more than once with, in Dirty Den's case. Um, so, so there's that kind of nostalgia for the show that it was better um, in my day, again, kind of picking up on themes from, from the previous panel, as well uh, in, as, as in the ways that they participate and co-produce it's um it's imagined geography and we certainly see that on the on the wiki because you see now i've got the set um thanks adam the, the the tube map from there and there's all kinds of locations and histories of the cafe and the queen vix owners and all this kind of historical information it's, it's very very detailed um okay so i'm pleased to be on time thanks for that adam um just to to tentatively conclude then um, this research will aim, I feel like I'm starting the presentation, the research will aim to investigate the distinct imagined geographies of London's East End in BBC TV's EastEnders. It will explore unanswered questions about nostalgia and popular culture, um, its exclusionary nature in the show, essentially, its neglect of other stories, characters, cultures and spaces that are characteristic of, of the East End of London. Um, and to do so, I will take a post-colonial approach in order to attend to some of the ways that this is racialized in the context of migration and empire, things that are very, very relevant in the East End of London. Um, and there are questions about genre, and I'm sure these, these will come up throughout the next couple of days. Um, you know, Ivan was talking about Doctor Who and it, it's, it's kind of programmed to change and regenerate. Um, can EastEnders do that? is that the blueprint of the 1960s Coronation Street all around the pub and the market, can that change? And if it can't, then can we have that kind of progress um, or is it limited by, um, by its genre? Um, again, I don't have um, answers yet, just questions. Um, and this is the references that I'm, I'm, I'm working from right now. So um, yeah, thanks. And thank you very much, Alex. Uh, it uh, really sounds like an exciting research project. And as someone who's gone kind of the other way uh, from a kind of film and television background to kind of incorporate human geography in my own kind of research approaches, I'm really looking forward to seeing how uh, you find it uh, coming the other way. Oh. So, yeah, 
Uh, that's great. Uh, so yeah, our next speaker uh, I'll introduce is uh, Derek Johnston, who is lecturer in broadcast at Queen's University Belfast and author of Haunted Seasons, Television Ghost Stories for Christmas and Horror for Halloween, alongside various chapters and articles on science fiction and horror television and film. So whenever you're ready, uh, Derek, please take it away. Okay, let's see if I can get myself set up here. Uh, I can work out how to do the playing, sharing a screen bit. Uh, okay, that's um, looking far too Okay, I didn't realize that was going to require some permission, so I'll do without the visuals and I'll instead just um, talk to you, if that's all right. So, um, folk horror is a genre that has been receiving a growing amount of attention over the past few years, building mainly on scattered considerations of individual texts before that. The genre is one that has been, is both very specifically focused and curiously undefined. It's specifically focused in that there's a commonly recognised core group of texts which find a general, uh, Blood on Satan's Claw and The Wicker Man. And these are three 1970s British films of the supernatural. But it is well, Witchfinder General was 1968. But the genre is curiously undefined in the way that it has um, extended outwards from these texts to incorporate a range of films, um, TV series, prose, music, and imagery. Now, as someone who generally follows Jason Mittell's conception of genres as cultural categories, which are defined by their use rather than by some centralizing governing definition. This matter of definition is both not that important to me because I don't think there should be a specific definition, but it's also very important because what matters when genre is considered as a cultural category is what people do with the genre and what what they do with the genre then tells us. So this paper considers one of the aspects that's common to many folk horror texts and that's how they deal with connections to the past. In particular one of the things that interests me about folk horror is the way that they present a complex appeal or set of appeals. This paper, in other words, is part of my ongoing development of the idea that a key factor in folk horror is that it is ambivalent. In particular, this paper focuses on using Svetlana Boim's conceptions of nostalgia as a tool to help illuminate that ambivalence and those multiple appeals. In this way, it reinforces the importance of the audience member and their individual attitudes and interpretations to the genre and the individual texts, while also showing how these individual interpretations and attitudes can be recognized as part of broader social attitudes and positions. In particular, we can relate these to attitudes to the past and to issues of identity. It's probably not needed for this particular conference, but a quick refresh on the particular elements of Boim's conception of nostalgia that I will be using here. Boim differentiates between two different primary forms of nostalgia, the reflective and the restorative. Reflective nostalgia uses the past as a tool recognizing that it is impossible to return to those imagined halcyon days, but that it is possible to reflect on our imagination of them and so to learn from them. It 
quote, explores ways of inhabiting many places at once and imagining different time zones, end quote. Recognizing that we can desire to be in a past, but that we have to continue to exist in the present and so to create the future. Restorative nostalgia, on the other hand, desires a return to the past, albeit to a past which often never actually existed. This form of nostalgia, quote, does not think of itself as nostalgia, but rather as truth and tradition, end quote. And so refuses to acknowledge the constructed nature of the ideas of the past, or that it is impossible to return to them because current conditions are different. So how can we use those different forms of nostalgia to help us understand the ambiguities of folk horror? They already show how the past can be approached from two very different positions. And I argue that these positions are themselves present and in tension within many folk horror texts. This is perhaps most obvious in 1973's The Wicker Man. So let us start there. <clears throat> The Wicker Man presents a remote Scottish community which is run by Lord Summerisle. His grandfather encouraged the community to return to paganism as part of his introduction of commercial fruit cultivation on the island, as an additional incentive to work for him alongside wages. The crops flourished on apparently barren soil and so the paganism stuck, until the modern islanders have come become completely absorbed in it. So this can be interpreted as a reflective form of nostalgia on the part of Lord Summerisle, using ideas of the culture of the past as a way of encouraging new behaviours in the general populace <clears throat> under the guise of a return to the old. To the people though, this might be considered restorative nostalgia. They have seen that this return to the past has results, that a return to the old ways has benefits. These benefits are not only in the fruitfulness of the land, but in community and in a more open approach to sexuality, all under the guise of tradition. It does not matter to them that these traditions have been cobbled together by Lord Summerisle from a mix of sources. Caesar's accounts of the German campaigns, Fraser's Golden Bound. Similarly, in Boehm's formulation of restorative nostalgia, it does not matter that the past that is, that is invoked is an imagined one. It is the imagery and the idea of the past that are important. <clears throat> At this point then, we have an authority figure exerting control over the common people by cynically manipulating their ideas of the past in order to encourage certain behaviours which in turn would support his profits in the form of the money made from exporting the produce of Summer Isle. The people are happy to go along with this because they are happy with their return to an imagined form of the past with folk song, folk dances, rituals and revels. This could be understood as the success of the nostalgic aspects of folk revivals, for example, of the desire to return to a simpler way of living in touch with nature and the seasons. It shows, apparently, that it can work. And then the crops fail. The nostalgia is revealed as nostalgia, as the recreation of an imagined past as reimagining the present in the shape of a past that never actually was. Now, if the traditions fail, then that can reveal the lies that were the foundation of this way of living. The current Lord Summerisle cannot have those lies exposed and so has to reinforce them, building on them, digging deeper into the imagined past. And so they come to the more terrible sacrifice of the Wicker Man. And in that more terrible sacrifice, we see the tensions of folk horror made clear. The folk of Summer Isle 
gather together in joyful song to celebrate their festival, while the outsider suffers the horror of sacrifice. This blind return to an imagined past that never really existed, Scottish islanders acting at the behest of an English lord to recreate a ritual of Germanic tribespeople described in propaganda by their Roman enemy, this is the epitome of restorative nostalgia. Seeing this construction for what it is, wanting to recreate the sense of community and connection to nature, but without the elements of sacrifice and rejection of outsiders, and acknowledging that new ways are needed, that is reflective nostalgia. Now that is just one text. But I think that we can see these patterns in other films, TV programs, novels. Midsummer is an obvious example, although there, there is the difference that the ancient practices are actually native and appear to actually be continuations of traditions rather than recreations and reinventions. So that means that for the people of the Hürger, this is not about nostalgia as there's no return, only continuation. However, for the visiting Americans and English characters and for the audience looking in, there is the appeal of the community in touch with nature and its cycles, seemingly at peace with each other. This is symbolized in the film by things like the communal sleeping arrangements, the communal eating arrangements, the sense that all is done and experienced together and by the set patterns of life in which everyone knows their place. And this idea of everyone knowing their place is a clear comfort when compared with the stresses and uncertainties of modern life and can be found in a number of folk horror texts. In the original Wicker Man, each person has their role to play in life and in ritual from school teacher to fool, laird to landlord's daughter. Similarly, in Robin Redbreast, we see the roles of sage, executioner, crone, mother and ritual king. At a time of increasing job insecurity, increased movement and a detachment from place and community, there are clear appeals to this idea of having a role and a meaningful one that connects you to others. But again, in folk horror, we must remember that one of those ritual roles is ultimately that of sacrifice. So I think that one of the ways that we can use Boehm's conception of nostalgia as either reflective or restorative is to help us to think about our own reactions to these texts. Do we cheer on the pagans as they sacrifice the symbol of authority, as they slaughter the harvest king that his blood may feed the land, as they follow their ancient rites and traditions with deaths willing and unwilling. Then maybe we should question why we are prepared to accept such practices in the name of tradition, and maybe we consider what other causes might make us consider such practices as acceptable. Or do we instead see this as the horror of the grip of tradition and of nostalgic recreation taken too far? But Boehm's formulation does not just help with considering personal responses. Boehm herself links the consideration of nostalgia to different political conceptions of national identity. She notes that, quote, this typology of nostalgia allows us to distinguish between national memory that is based on a single plot of national identity and social memory, which consists of collective frameworks that mark but do not define the individual memory." End quote. In other words, the typology allows us to separate those concepts of memory which are narrowly, narrowly nationalistic looking to the past as one true golden age to be returned to. And those concepts of memory and collective, which are not limited by the national, but which engage with the complexities of experience of the past 
and the different experiences of the past shared by different groups to inform the present. I argue that folk horror is accessible to both, that it draws particularly on ideas of a true national narrative that can return or which has survived in a hidden way, but that it also makes complexity part of its narrative, raising the question of whether this national identity is worth its cost. The relevance of this to current issues is clear from Boehm's statement that, quote, modern nostalgia is a mourning for the impossibility of mythical return, for the loss of an enchanted world with clear borders and values, end quote. This is where I think these conceptions of nostalgia can help us in thinking about the particular relevance and appeal of folk horror at this moment as well as about the context in which those original folk horror texts arose. It is also where we can take heed of Raymond Williams' reminder that in English, country is both a nation and a part of a land, making the link between ideas of nation and ideas of the rural and natural explicit, the idea that a nation and its identity arises from the specifics of the land. And similarly, folk horror connects the ideas of identity with that of the rural and the natural, often in very direct ways, as in The Wicker Man or Midsummer, or Robin Redbreast or The Living and the Dead. So the late 1960s and early 1970s that brought that original folk horror unholy trinity were a time of economic decline and social arrest in the U unrest in the UK combined with a growing awareness of the ecological costs of modern life. Returning to the past in a sense of community and self-sufficiency seemed a sensible movement in terms of preserving the self and the planet, moving forward or even surviving economically meant joining the European economic community, a move that was widely embraced. Entertainment at that time made nostalgic calls back to the Victorian and Edwardian eras of British imperial supremacy, possibly in part as a cultural response to the evident loss of British global power, but also engaged with the sense of new beginnings through the rural, even in terms of things like the good life. But then we come to now, where ecological collapse is even more evident, where societies and communities often seem to be even more fractured, and where connections to the past seem far less clear and common. Where a conservative government led the UK into Europe in the 1970s in order to save it following the end of empire, now a conservative government leads the UK out of Europe. Those responsible do so making nostalgic calls back to the time of empire, or even more commonly to the Blitz spirit, continuing a myth of Britain alone that rejects the reality that the UK at the time was still supported by the empire and was hardly a little island all alone. But to recognise this would complicate the simplicity necessary for these messages. This is restorative nostalgia at its clearest statement of a desire to return to a time that it, it is impossible to return to, in large part because it was a time that never actually existed, not in the way it's depicted. Folk horror plays its part in this by presenting the pleasures and challenges of the past together. Yes, being part of a community where everyone knows everyone, where everyone has their place and all celebrate together would be nice, especially if it was part of a lifestyle more in touch with nature and making less of an environmental impact. But this also means being apart from the rest of the world. It means not just abandoning the pleasures and benefits of the modern world, but it means becoming disconnected from it. That may be the problem at the root of the failing crops in the Wicker Man, the land is exhausted and may be affected by climate change or environmental damage spilling over from the rest of the world. 
We cannot forget that the world is one interconnected system and to retreat from it is parochial, insular, but the interconnectedness is impossible to escape and to try to remain separated from the world runs its own risks. Returning to traditions, real or invented, means sacrifices, metaphorical and literal. Escaping the power of central government means giving yourself over to local power, and that is far more personal. Reflective nostalgia acknowledges the appeals and tries to learn from them, building community, acting in a more ecologically friendly way. Restorative nostalgia seeks to take us back to a time that probably never was, and which cannot be again, with little regard for the costs of doing so. To round up, folk horror is a genre for our moment because it is a genre of uncertainty. It is a genre for long, of longing for that which cannot be recovered, a genre which asks us what we would sacrifice in order to return to that idyll and to preserve it, while also asking how we would feel when confronted with others who wish to sacrifice us to preserve their idealised connection to the land and to their identity. And it is a genre which ultimately refuses to provide us with simple answers in a complex world. So which powers do you want to be sacrificed to? Thank you. And sorry about the technical problem. Uh, no, sorry. I'm sorry uh, myself, Derek. Uh, thank you very much for adapting very smoothly to it. It was a fantastic paper and um, um, uh, it's very, very uh, horrifically relevant in the current time. So thank you. Uh, for that. Um, our final speaker for the panel today uh, is Stephen Adams, who is Associate Dean of Research at the School of Creative Arts at the University of Hertfordshire. Stephen's research interests centre around the visual and material culture of the French Revolution and the early 19th century and the construction of artists' professional identities in early 19th century France. He's also written widely on landscape painting, landscape and gender, the formation of the art market in early 19th century France and the art market's relation to the formation of modernist conceptions of art. So for the final time, whenever you're ready, Stephen, thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, if I now share my screen, I am practicing this a lot. Can you all see, can you all see that clearly? Oh, uh, not currently, Stephen, sorry. Um, Shelley, is there any way to, uh, look into this. <laughs> um, it should be if you just press share screen, um, it should give you an option for what one you want to share. Okay, let's go back to any luck? No, not yet. Okay. Oh, there you go. Think oh, perfect. Yeah, great. I don't know. I don't know why that worked, which makes me slightly nervous um okay i'm gonna put that on full screen and keep my fingers crossed and hope is that still visible yep all grand that's perfect fantastic um i'm a microsoft teams user uh, mostly so get slightly nervous with uh, with zoom okay well look thanks uh, for the invitation to do this paper um i feel a, um, a little bit of an imposter uh because um I'm, my background, um, as you heard, is really uh, in art history, or more accurately, uh, the visual and material culture um, of the um, French Revolutionary period in the 19th century. Um, when I came to watch American, An American in Paris, um, I was struck by um, its familiarity. I knew of it, but hadn't really uh, sat down and ever watched it carefully. When I did so, uh, the resonances, the nostalgic resonances with um, some of the material that I was familiar, the visual and material culture of the 18th century were striking. And it is that, um, those connections, those nostalgic connections that I want to try to uh, begin uh, to explore. Now, this is still visible, everybody? Yep, all good. Yeah. yeah, great, fantastic. Okay. So in an attempt to lend Vincente Minnelli's 1951 uh, film, An American in Paris, uh, greater uh, authenticity, 
its female lead, Leslie Caron, tried to convince the makeup department at MGM to cut her hair in the then uh, fashionable gamine manner um, of Parisian women, a style made famous by Jacques Fart's um, uh, model, uh, Bettina Graziani. And you can see uh, Leslie Caron on the left and Bettina Graziani uh, in the center. And her, her faltering English having uh, failed her, Caron did the job herself with nail scissors and a hand mirror, and the result was disastrous and sufficient to halt the film's production uh, for three weeks while her hair partially uh, grew back. Um, Jean Kelly, her mentor and star of An American in Paris, as you'll know, um, advised her that starlets had been uh, sacked for this. And the anecdote recorded in Carl's autobiography, uh, Thank Heaven of uh, 2011, um, which is a fascinating read, um, is instructive because I think it, it points to an abrasion between two different kinds of Parisianism. A set of conventions for uh, the city's mythic construction. One seen from the vantage point of a capital struggling to reassert its cultural authority after four years of occupation, and the other informed from Minelli's uh, imagination. In fact, it's informed through a fairly extensive archive of clippings uh, about the city. Um, and uh, Minelli, I don't think, set foot in, in, in Paris, although some of the uh, establishing shots at the very beginning of the film uh, were made from uh, uh, footage of the Arc de Triomphe and, and, and so on. And it really, I think it's the second city, which I'd suggest is no more or less authentic than the first that I want to explore. And if we think about uh, the etymology of nostalgia, homesickness, as we, we've heard, Paris becomes the, the, the nostos, the home to which we're painfully trying to return. And moreover, as I'll try and show, Nostalgia has a, a, an affective generative capacity to shape cultural forms, um, as evidenced here uh, by Shirley MacLaine's adoption of Caron's botched hairstyle in Alfred Hitchcock's 1955 film, The, the Trouble with Harry. We can see uh, Shirley MacLaine on the right hand side. And you know, uh, you can add to uh, the list of your own uh, famous. Uh, French short haircuts, Audrey Hepburn, notably, and more recently, Audrey uh, Tatum. So um, first, um, a bit about the film's plot and how an affection for the past might be entangled with it. And I use the term affection, I think, as an affect in a kind of Deleuzean sense. And Jerry Mulligan, a recently demobilized uh, GI, stays behind in Paris to follow a lifetime's ambition to become a painter. And he's one of, uh, of 4,000 other GIs who'd signed up to various Parisian art schools as part of the GI Bill, an adult education program for demo uh, demobilized soldiers. Um, very well funded, uh, they get uh, $75 a month, which was uh, significantly more than most Parisians suffering from the after effects of occupation had to live on. And uh, Jerry, um, let's see if we can, there we are. Uh, Jerry, uh, on the left, uh, almost falls prey to a scheming and beautiful suitor, one uh, Milo, uh, she says, as in Venus de, who promises sex, wealth, critical, critical acclaim. But Jerry really only cares for Lise, uh, Leslie Cahon, we see on the right hand side, the asexual gamine sweetheart of his, his friend, Henri, the then popular uh, singer, Georges Guettari. After some magnificent dance sequences, and, and the plot is uh, very thin indeed, and was recognized as such by uh, critics of the period, although it cleaned up in 1951 in terms of Oscar awards. Um, after some magnificent dance sequences, uh, Milo, uh, Milo and Jerry attend the, uh, the Bal des Beaux-Arts in Mar Montmartre, where he accidentally meets Lise again, only soon to part before she and her fiancé head off uh, for their honeymoon in the United States. And here we see uh, Jerry and Milo 
um, at the uh, at the Bal des Beaux Arts. I mean, purely, and as I go through this, I'm I find myself littering all of my comments with footnotes. The Bal des Beaux Arts didn't actually exist in 1951. It had existed up until 1939, but in 1955 it was reinstituted by the uh, French government as a way of celebrating a kind of nostalgic image of Parisianism. So although we're you know, concerned with a film and arts relationship to the film, it's interesting to see that there are these countless kind of spin-offs whereby uh, nostalgia is actually beginning to be part of a lived experience of what it is uh, to uh, be Parisian. Um, at the 11th hour, after an extended dance sequence that lasts some 17 minutes, set in the imaginary space of one of Jerry's sketches, they skip through the history of modern art, or rather the nostalgic history of modern French art seen from the vantage point of Minelli's back lot in Culver City, the, uh, the point where the, uh, the location in which the film was made. And just to show you the connection between uh, French art of the period and uh, the, one of the stage sets, um, we have Jerry um, on the left-hand side, uh, and on the right-hand side, we have a picture by uh, Maurice Soutrillo, uh, the Rue Norba in, in Montmartre. So um, the, my suggestion is that, you know, uh, Trillo is very much in the forefront of the mind of the uh, stage uh, designers on the left. But remember that the place to be by 1951, if you're a serious American artist, is New York's East Village at the Cedar Tavern the home of um, abstract uh, expressionism. And remember too that the American vanguard has effectively severed its links with Europe. French government attempted to find points of continuity between American and European avant-garde art, but uh, I think it's fair to say that as, for, as far as art's concerned at least, Paris had essentially uh, had its day, and it you know it continues to be uh, predominant, uh, as we know, in terms of philosophy, critical theory, notably, um, but much in, in film indeed, uh, but much less so in terms of um, uh, the fine arts, and also we might add um, uh, pop music. For Minelli, however, Paris still holds all of the cultural cards as Gene Kelly dances around pictures by the Douanier Rousseau, Renoir, Van Gogh, Degas, Toulouse, Lautrec, and Trello, all of whom have their feet firmly planted uh, in the uh, 19th century. And again, to uh, show you how, the extent to which the film draws upon, um, the extent to which fil the film draws upon um, uh, con contemporary uh, Parisian painting, we have a watercolour by Raoul Dufy on the right hand side and part of that 17 minute dance sequence that I spoke about a moment ago. And I, for my next slide, we have on the screen, um, it's, oh, there we are. Uh, sorry, I've got this out of sequence. Um, we've got a, um, one of uh, Jerry's works uh, visible uh, in the background, you can see hanging on his wall there. And I just wanted to show you what American art was actually like. And you can see uh, on the right hand side, we have um, a photograph by Cecil Beaton using a painting by Jackson Pollock. And to think that both of those uh, images were made you know, within the same year. And it shows that uh, the extent to which uh, there's a gap between uh, the imagined nostalgic image of American painting on the left-hand side and the, uh, the reality, uh, if you will, on the right. I wanted also to mention the artists responsible for uh, Jerry's paintings. One, Jean Grant, a minor painter turning out Impressionist paintings uh, in California, who, apart from the picture on sale, uh, on eBay at the moment for 250 quid has completely disappeared from the art historical record. This one here was actually used in the film um, 
uh, and as one of Jerry's paintings. The moment the sequence, the 17 minute sequence that I spoke about uh, a moment ago ends, Lise appears having um, abandoned her, her fiance and she and Jerry embrace, uh, forgive me, there we are. She and Jerry embrace over a panoramic view of the city, uh, one that's actually been used by Balzac, by Zola, and uh, more recently, uh, the one occupied by Amélie Poulain, the gamine heroine of the fabulous Destin d'Amélie Poulain, uh, at which point the uh, film ends. Uh, this is the uh, Rue Foyetier uh, in Paris, and many of you may actually have uh, visited it. So if we take uh, a deep breath, we might think of nostalgia, not simply as a wistful desire for something lost, nor even the desiring desire of Jacques Lacan's uh, Objet Petit Art, but rather as a desiring desire set in an imagined city sustained by nothing other than desiring desirers. We might go one step further and say that the pain of desiring desire, the algos, if you will, is the very condition of art and always has been ever since art became modern. But let's sort of think a bit about art history, the sort that Jerry Mulligan and also the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu might recognize. One of the things that makes art modern is that it has no purpose. When the lovely Milo asked to buy one of Jerry's pictures, he has no idea of its price. He explains he doesn't sell that much. But he's clearly no hack. Remember that his entire life is devoted to art. And the galvanizing genius responsible for an art of such transcendental uh, unit, uh, uselessness must of necessity leave the world behind. And in Paris, uh, these uh, conventions have their origin in musical theater dating back to the 18th century, specifically in vaudeville, uh, in um, uh, one act musical comedies. And if I can show you one here. Um, on the left hand side, we have uh, a painter called Lontara, and he is known for his kind of happy go lucky, poor, carefree, carefree asexual attitude towards the world. He's an innocent. And on the right hand side, we have uh, the uh, front page of a musical comedy uh, performed uh, in 1809 called Lantara, uh, the painter in the pub, if you will, the part of Cabaret. And my point here, I think, is that Lantara and Jerry are out of the same mold, like poor, care carefree, asexual otherworldliness that I mentioned a moment ago. And these bohemian tropes are played out through the comedy um, with a very light touch so that no other narrative uh, in intrudes. So when art became modern sometime around the French Revolution, the period who knew a thing or two about uh, haircuts, of course, it was democratized. Anyone could have a crack at it, but it also became essentially useless. And art becomes nothing other than a, a kind of repository of genius, the repository of the, uh, the personal and physical integrity of the painter themselves. So back then, the way to become an artist was to behave like one, to head to the city, to be poor, but happy, to take a garret, to be eternally waiting on the cusp of recognition. Artists might fall in love, but the object of their devotion was always uh, desexualized because you know, the, 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 their true raison d'etre was always art. The musical theater of the period uh, decreed bad art risible, the source of uh, folly and delusion, but by contrast, good art was often valorized through the integrity of the painter, whose contract with his art insists that his masculinity is channeled into painting. And this happens to Jerry uh, and to an early prototype that we see here, uh, Simon Mathieu Lantara. And I think that what I'd suggest is that in some shape or form, this is the nostalgic myth that sustained modern art for years. The continuity between, you know, my starting point in the 1770s and the uh, 1950, of course it twists, it frays, it gets woven into the fabric of high culture and low. But it's this essentially nostalgic formulary 
that gets called on by Minelli, I'd suggest, working away in Culver City, having not set foot in Paris. An, integra an integral part of this tradition is the rejection of a fully sexualized heterosexual womanhood uh, as an encumbrance on, on, on art. And Milo, remember, is beautiful, but like her namesake, she's incomplete. Her designs on Jerry are spotted from the outset and contrasted with the Gamine Lees, beautiful, innocent, and boy-like. She and Jerry take them to form. Oh, my cat has just jumped onto my notes, but that's the perils of home working. She and Jerry and, um, take on the form, not of carnal lovers taking the Paris art world by storm, but, by, uh, but of childhood innocent sweethearts in a world created and sustained exclusively by art. Indeed, Lisa's beauty and a haircut seems to give her adolescence um, a kind of moral guarantor of the urban spaces she and Jerry fill, the spaces of seduction, uh, Milo's apartment at the Ritz are off limits to Jerry and Lee's. We only ever find them alone and outside. When they're inside, they're chaperoned by Parisians, in Jerry's words, thoroughly nice people. But art still needs a mise-en-scene to operate. And this is found not in Milo's world, but in Parisian Bohemia, Jerry's nostos of, 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 for art, if you will. However, our Paris is not a uh, geographically specific site. And I'm interested to uh, think about some of the points raised about EastEnders. Um, at the start of the film, we have the estab establishing shots of the uh, Tour Eiffel and the Arc de Triomphe. And Montmartre is the liminal point where Bohemia and capitalism meet and where Jerry first encounters uh, Milo and where Milo buys um, uh, two of Jerry's pictures. But home, the Nostos of art, is a mythical place away from the tourist spots, somewhere on the left bank within striking distance of a bar. This is typically a setting in which all of the tropes of bohemianism can be played out. Uh, for Lontar, it's a cafe called the Cafe Fribourg, and for Jerry, I've forgotten the name of the bar, but it's a similar uh, watering hole uh, that uh, Jerry uh, has, and he drops in there, and there all the bohemian tropes that we spoke about a moment ago can be played out. Um, so already then, we are entangled with a, a, a skein of these kind of affiliations some real, others imagined, and others made real through the effective power of the imaginary. And of course, the boundary between them is only ever lightly policed. I think one of the things that I found striking, um, bringing some of this research together, and it really is in the early stages, is that um, we might think of nostalgia, we might think of you know there being a genuine Paris. It's very, very hard to maintain those boundaries. The two uh, are uh, always permeable. Um, we have here a 1947 edition of um, a magazine uh, produced for uh, GIs called Yank. And here um, we have pictures put together, a portfolio of pictures put together by uh, Private First Class Pat Coffey of the 359th in Infantry. And he was tasked with following a group of three soldiers around the city. Um, and you can see, we find them here in front of the Moulin Rouge, well known to Jerry, in front of Notre Dame. Um, and in the bottom left hand, bottom right hand side, you can see um, harassing a poor woman who's named as uh, Giselle. Sorry, Stephen, I'll just uh, get you to wrap up if possible, just if you okay, can. Okay, yeah. So um, we find broadly um, this kind of nostalgic search for an imaginary Paris, which is colluding in it, 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 its own uh, mythology. Um, and at this time, of course, uh, we have um, artists who are leaving, uh, American artists who are leaving Paris aware that it's had its day. And I wanted to conclude on this final point uh, by showing um, a painting by uh, uh, Ossip Zadkin uh, on the left-hand side and a picture by Jerry Youngerman on the right. 
uh, the work by Zadkin is how art used to be in Paris. This is the art that's kind of losing ground. On the right hand side, we have an American aggressive flat, two dimensional forward looking art. And um, I think when Youngerman uh, was producing work like this, uh, he was really effectively aware that Paris uh, was pretty much exhausted and only lived on in the uh, nostalgic memory of bohemianism. And I'll end on that point. Thank you. Grant, thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, and thank you for everyone for your papers. Uh, we've got about, um, I've just heard from Shelley about until quarter past for the uh, Q&A. So if anyone has any questions now, uh, please use the uh, raised hand function in the chat, or if you'd like to put them in the chat, we'll uh, try and uh, get to them via that way as well. Between me and Shelley, we'll try and do that. Uh, but if uh, this session does overrun, because I know we've got four speakers and we might have a lot of questions, uh, we are more than happy to uh, hopefully some of the speakers talk about some of this in the Discord chat as well, which uh, will be available throughout the two days of the conference as well. But uh, I see we've got some questions already, so I'll start with Martin Jones, if possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam. And thanks, everybody, for some really interesting and diverse presentations. Uh, I've got a question for Alex, uh, please, about your research uh, on EastEnders. I and mean, you might have covered some of this, and you know it might not be a lot more to add to it, but what I find interesting about EastEnders, do you, do you think there's really, for audiences that are non-Londoners, like myself, you know, being in the Northwest, do you think we have a nostalgia for EastEnders as a construct rather than an actual idea of, you know, actual London East End life? Uh, and how do you think that makes it more complex for people watching EastEnders who are Londoners? Because uh, I think there's a real differentiation between that experience of what London really is and this kind of evocation of London that you get in EastEnders. Uh, because I think what's interesting as well between you know, difference-wise between Coronation Street and EastEnders, EastEnders kind of functions on this idea of cock cockniness, whereas Coronation Street doesn't really, you know, being a mank isn't integral to Coronation Street, whereas, you know, that identity is integral to how EastEnders functions. Uh, so that was just, you know, what I wanted to ask you more about. Thanks for that question, Martin. And yeah, I, I definitely don't have an answer, <laughs> but... um. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. EastEnders does rest on that kind of specific imagined geography, you know, like you said, cockneyness. Um, and, you know, we see with the introduction of um, Danny Dyer and his character is very much trying to um, kind of hammer that home, whereas Coronation Street is kind of just vaguely northern. And I guess the only way I can try and answer that is growing up in Manchester, in very kind of working class in a city Manchester I, I watched Coronation Street as a kid thinking where the where is this supposed to be because it doesn't look it's supposed to be Salford you wouldn't get Ken Barlow in Salford um you know so that always confused me a bit and kind of wound me up actually when I was maybe about 15 16 but with EastEnders yeah it, it, I don't know how Londoners feel about it and I didn't go to London until I was about 20 years old and I wasn't naive enough to think EastEnders is real London. Um, but I, I, I think perhaps people are suckered into that. And um, Lemwedger and O'Donnell findings, some of the interviews they, they did, actually people did find the characters, the settings, fairly believable and, and fairly realistic. That, that perhaps this kind of market stall, fruit and veg guy, jelly veal vans is, is fairly typical of, of perhaps uh, Bromley by Bow or Newham or Stratford, which are all heavily gentrified, by the way. Gentrification has barely touched them. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know, but it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, this non Londoner um, Cockney audiences thing. So, thanks for that, Martin. Grant, uh, we've got a question from uh, Vicky Brewster. Is, again, if you'd like to just come in the chat to ask. Uh, hi. Um, thank you. Really interesting papers. Um, I had a question for Derek. I was really interested by what you said about um, the creation of nostalgia in Midsummer for the non-native characters. And I was wondering to what extent you think that 
the, some of those ideas of community were actually made horrific. I'm thinking of, um, for example, the sex scene where every all the women in the village get involved and the, the viewing of the su suicides. So it's about how um, making tradition horrific for outsiders, is that what you're saying? Um, I think um, I, one of the things Midsommar does very nicely is having those academic characters going in and essentially doing academic thing of studying a a community and first of all going oh this is weird that's interesting and then going this but also doing this is horrifying and i think that it does what it does in an interesting way is it displaces us quite a lot um you're talking about the the sex scene the rape scene if you like um it's it, it's step back it's watching we are observers and i think that by that that's helping with that sense of ambiguity which i'm suggesting is not maybe not necessary for folk horror but is a common recurrence in a lot of folk horror um so it's horrific but it's also in a way up to us to find the horror does that make sense does that answer your question as well yeah that's great thank you uh we've got a uh question from craig clark i can see you in the chat uh if you'd like to come in to ask hi everyone uh, thanks i just echo the thanks for all those great talks i found myself wanting to ask questions of everyone but i'll stick to just asking derek because i'm also interested in svetlana boim's uh, nostalgia and something I'll talk about tomorrow and I was intrigued by whether one of the readings of Midsummer is that you could probably read it as being all in Danny's head um, and that sort of psychologizing of nostalgia and how you thought that might inflect a reading of the film as being restorative or reflective within her mind. Oh that's a really good and challenging question to throw at me considering I've seen the film once and I couldn't tell you if it was the director's cut or not. Um, I think it's a really interesting reading and certainly the film is very concerned with her psychology. Um, didn't, was it Asta said that it's a breakup movie? You know, so it's, it's all about her, but yeah, breaking up in what ways? There's, there's all sorts of disintegration happening yeah I think she is oh yeah you've put me right on the spot I'm not sure how to answer I think but and, I, and I, I'm going to leave that to interpretation mm. but I can certainly see how you can see this as her using these ideas of community and togetherness and empowerment if you like um as a way of restoring a sense of self mm, which wasn't necessarily there before which you can see from the whole life cycle thing the idea that things must come to an end but also her increasing integration with culture and with nature and, uh, and particularly integration with sight you know the way she becomes part of nature so yeah that would be my starting point and a few months or years down the line i might have an answer for you thank you very much Grand. Uh, i'm not seeing any, any questions as such in the chat at the minute so i've got one which i'd like to try and link uh daniel and jorge's uh, video essay and stephen's uh, paper on an american in paris if i may uh just a question which is quite broad so uh, feel free to interpret it however you'd like um and the first panel um uh, Bethan mentioned um, the concept of spatio-temporal nostalgia, and that's something which I think feeds across quite a lot, all four of these papers, in which it's very much connected to a space in time, which uh, has subsequently uh, been kind of reinterpreted by uh, audiences going through, but also uh, in the films themselves, definitely in T2, the event of uh, Renton coming back to his home city and feeling like a tourist in that 
the environment being greeted with the leaflet and uh for yourself Stephen, talking about the uh the mo most uh recognizable shots such as the uh, staircase in montmartre which appears in uh many other sort of iterations but is uh kind of this fixed symbol of uh parisianness uh i don't know if either uh of the uh papers uh either daniel or jorge or Stephen, you'd like to talk a bit more about how space and time are so connected within these contexts, if that's all right. Yeah, I mean, I, if very briefly, if I can comment on that, it's a really intriguing question. I think that there clearly, you know, if you think about that shot from Yank, there clearly is a, you know, a time of Paris and there are people in it experiencing Paris. And then if you think about the establishing shots, which I think were kind of basic film stock that were put at the very beginning of the film, you know, these are physical locations. But I was very struck by how, if you wanted to really play out this, uh, this nostalgic uh, bohemian myth of what it was to be a carefree footloose uh, artist, you had to remove yourself from tangible physical spaces and tuck yourself i mean jerry says at the very beginning of the film he you know th these are my this is my community and the left bank but he doesn't say where on the left bank and it is this mysterious place and it made me think of you know the foucauldian idea of um of you know heterotopia sort of heter another space and also another time and one thing you know and i i, I mentioned the huge number of um uh, footnotes that I wanted to add as I was going through the whole presentation. In 1951, if you were a Parisian, you would have been incredibly hungry. Paris would have been an immiserable place. And the Nazi occupation doesn't fe uh, feature in the film at all. In fact, right at the very beginning, there's um, a waltz uh, a sequence between um, uh, Jean um, and uh, uh, get away and they dance around to german inspired military music which seemed to me incredible and it's an indication of how we you know we're looking at a um, a timeless space and also a space that is paris but it's not any paris that anyone can go out and put their finger on you know that sort of identify as a concrete location well, thank you and again uh to daniel and jorge just in the par uh, context of not paris but edinburgh i uh, didn't know if you had any thoughts on how uh, the film is uh, influenced by those questions of uh, space and time in the sort of spatio-temporal nostalgia. Perhaps not. It might, it might just be that there's a kind of a uh, technical uh, lag on there, so that's okay if not. Um, I'm sure that uh, I might be able to catch you later in the Discord. Uh, if uh, that's all right with everyone, though, um, I'll just bring this uh, panel to a close. And uh, thank you very much, Phil. I've got a, uh, oh, I've got a message from Jorge saying um, that the uh, voice function is blocked. Um, Shelley, might there be any reason why um, at this stage? I can't figure that out now. I can't see a reason why it would be. Okay. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Oh, cool, yeah, we can hear Okay, you. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. I didn't <laughs> know what happened. No, I just want to say two little things about the space and time, and it's in the, in the end of the video essay. Uh, we can see uh, Renton and the gang 20 years later, and we did, we, our work is denial of the easy nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry about my poor English. Eh? Daniel is the philologist, and I am, I, my, my English is... Um, in, in T2, we can see what happens when you come back to a space and time when you really weren't happy. They were junkies, crime, and we can see the, the, the comparison of uh, space and time in two moments is the bedroom. The bedroom, uh, Renton enters in the bedroom and we can see in the first part an, an very open, uh, spacious room. And and the denial of the easy nostalgia is come back to your own room 20 years later and see it's very, very, very tiny. Mm? And remember uh, the music. The music is not the same uh, listening to, to the same song, to a classic song like Last for Life uh, of Iggy Pop. Uh, the, the denial of, of 
the, the, the vinyl. The vinyl is the original vinyl of Iggy Pop and he can uh, hear the original as for life. Necessarily it's a remix. It's, it's, it's not the easy nostalgia that we see in, in, in things like Stranger Things and Fuller House and all the reboots and all the revivals and all the remakes. I don't know if it's enough. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and thank, yeah, great. Th and thank you to all of our panelists today. Uh, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, and uh, thank you for Shelley for the support. And I've been trying to chair it as well. I hope I've uh, done an all right job. But uh, I'll just uh, say that uh, we're going to have a lunch break next. Uh, that's going to last up until one o'clock. And then if you'd like to join back on the stream, A, we'll have the keynote presentation from Kate Egan. And uh, that will be, um, as I say, on stream A. So uh, I'll see you all back then. Have a great lunch. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Adam.